Good morning, Changemakers. Welcome to the second week of the Environmental Changemakers series brought to you by Environmental Scouts. You are no doubt joining us to hear from the incredible Dr. Lori Marino, president of Whale Sanctuary. Lori is here to teach us about the biology of whale brains. So we'll hear from Lori in just a moment. I am Adriana Glazner, co-founder of Environmental Scouts. I'm a mom, an education consultant, and today, like most days, I'm a proud teacher. Environmental Scouts is the vision of one of my students. Hi, Brooke. Hi. So with the help of her parents, Brooke's idea for an environmental club for kids quickly grew into an opportunity beyond what we could have ever expected. A chance to connect individual change and nonprofit organizations to share their educational resources for an amplified impact. Our Environmental Changemaker series is really our first labor of love to help achieve that goal. We want each of you to see that you are part of a coalition of partners worldwide, whether it be nonprofit organizations, NGOs, youth change makers, youth clubs, or individual kids and adults who are ready to be the change. There are so many groups and individuals out there that are already doing the work. There's fantastic materials and initiatives just waiting to be discovered. So we proudly bring you the Environmental Changemaker Series to amplify those voices and to help you find yours. Whether your cause is wildlife conservation, plastic pollution, climate change, building a sanctuary for whales, or a cause yet discovered, the earth needs you. So please like this video and subscribe below. You can also follow us on social media. Facebook is at Environmental Scouts and Instagram, we are at Enviro Scouts LA. So I'd like to introduce you to a couple of very special ones. First, Brooke Foreman, the youngest co-founder and inspiration behind Environmental Scouts. Brooke is a 10-year-old environmental activist and animal lover, and she also happens to be, as I mentioned, one of my students. Brooke, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. Great. Brooke, I want to introduce you to Dr. Lori Marino. Hi, so nice to meet you. Hi, hi Brooke. Hi, Adriana. Hi. hi. <laughs> We're so happy to have you, Lori. Let me tell our audience a little bit about you. Dr. Marino is a neuroscientist and expert in animal behavior and intelligence. So she was formerly on the faculty of Emory University. She received her PhD in biopsychology in 1995 and is internationally known for her work on the evolution of the brain and intelligence in dolphins and whales. She's an expert on marine mammal captivity issues such as dolphin-assisted therapy and the educational claims of the zoo and aquarium industry, which is very important. In 2001, she co-authored a groundbreaking study offering the first conclusive evidence for mirror self-recognition. You know what that is, Brooke, mirror self-recognition? Um, yeah, it's when an animal yeah. recognizes themselves in a mirror. That's amazing, we do that every day, but Dr. Marino figured out that bottlenose dolphins do that too. So um, Lori, who is, uh, obviously brilliant and we could go on and on. She's also the founder and executive director of the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy. She's appeared in several films and television programs such as the 2013 documentary Blackfish and we have her here as the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. Pretty amazing, right? So Brooke, why do you think this issue is so important? Why does this episode mean something to you? Um, my, the reason why this is so important to me is told within a story. So I would tell you that story. And so I love animals and I've always had a place in my heart for, um, dolphins and orcas in particular. And look, I have this little necklace charm. It's an orca. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. And so we went to the San Juan Islands exactly two years ago, actually. And we never supported SeaWorld, so we wanted to see wild orcas in their natural habitats. And while we were going there, we heard that there was a mother orca that after she gave birth to a calf, it died within 30 minutes. 
She pushed the dead body around for 17 days and her family members helped her. This shows that they are very intelligent creatures. They have certain dialects. So one pod will not be able to communicate with another. And they have very strong families and very strong cultures. They are struggling. The southern resident trans um, southern residents, the ones we went to see, the orcas, aren't doing well, and that's because their food, king salmon, are also struggling because of the dams that we built. The dams the dam block, block off their breeding grounds, and on top of that, we, they have water pollution and noise pollution. This was the trip that showed us that all these environmental issues are connected to each other. And what could I do? So, so that, that's also part of why Environmental Scouts was born. Oh, wow, Brooke, that's amazing. I think all of our audience can see just how inspirational you are and why we find the topic that we do to discuss because of your passion and your experiences. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so heartfelt. And um, I, as I mentioned to you uh, earlier, uh, when we were uh, before the, pod, uh, the podcast, um, that particular orca named Halakwa, mm -hmm. who pushed around her, her, her dead calf for 17 days, is now pregnant. Yeah. And, and she's, and we are all hoping for a successful pregnancy and for her child to be born happy and healthy. So stay tuned on that. But she is pregnant again. Oh, wow. That's great news. Yes. Yes. Great news. Crossing our fingers. <laughs> Aww. Well, Lori, we'd love to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about what you plan to talk about and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on this episode. Uh, it's really an honor. Uh, it's great to be talking with you guys and, and with your audience. Um, and as you mentioned, Adriana, I'm the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And we are in the process of creating a permanent sanctuary for beluga whales and orcas who are currently living in concrete tanks and in, in entertainment parks. And uh, the reason that we are so invested in doing that is because we realize these animals don't do well in concrete tanks. And that has to do with their big brains, their intelligence, their lifestyle, and I'll talk more about that um, in my presentation. But um, we are now engaged in creating a sanctuary in Nova Scotia, um, and I will let your audience know and let your audience see the actual cove where we are going to be building the first uh, whale sanctuary in North America. So I've had many experiences with orcas off the south coast of Iceland. And there you got to see them in their natural environment. You got to see them majestic in every way. They're wide ranging predators, traveling 100 miles a day and diving as much as 300 feet to forage. And they live in tightly knit family groups, often not leaving their birth family the whole lives. And in many of these families, the moms call all the shots about a level of, of emotional bonding that is beyond the par of what we experience as humans. Feelings and emotions come into play in orca and cetacean psychology in a very intense and very fundamental way. They have culture, they have dialects, they have interesting communication systems and a big brain, they're right up there with us. When you look at the orca brain through an MRI image, the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, the gray matter, 
is actually more convoluted than that of the human brain. For a brain like that, there is nothing to do in a concrete tank. There are actually 3,000 whales and dolphins in captivity around the world. There are 57 orca, more than 300 beluga, and they live in very small tanks, often not any deeper than the whales are long. A concrete tank is like a, an auditory hall of mirrors. At first, they're going to get back a lot of echoes, and eventually, they're going to realize there's nothing to echolocate on. And at that point, they simply shut down. And in captivity, they live in artificial families. Mothers and calves are separated based solely on commercial interest. Captive whales rarely live more than 20 years. Fewer than 50% lived more than four years after capture. The captive industry makes the point that they're providing education about orcas to all of their audiences. I think it's anti-educational. It teaches kids that we as humans should dominate them as opposed to anything about what they are as animals, what their culture is. The reason China and other countries are capturing orcas and other cetaceans and putting them in concrete tanks is because of the success of marine parks in this country. One could lose hope. One could say there are more and more animals being captured and the numbers we have today will, will be nothing compared to what could happen in the future. But we have to put our hope in children to stand up and say no, and will demand of their parents, no matter where they live on the planet, that we treat these animals with understanding and care and keep them in the wild. As the public ethic around keeping whales and dolphins in captivity changes, people are demanding that the shows stop and that the animals have an opportunity to live in more natural environments. Most of the animals today in captivity were born in captivity. So releasing them would be in many ways tragic because they do not have the skills to survive in the wild. The best solution is to build natural seaside sanctuaries where captive whales and dolphins can live in an environment as close to their natural habitat as we can provide. They'll have a sandy bottom with critters, fish, and crabs with whom to interact. They'll have birds on the surface to chase. And they will have space, more than 300 times more than the largest performance tank in captivity. The captivity industry is looking at us. The public has the power to end this suffering. Sanctuaries have been built for elephants, for gorillas, and big cats. And now is the time to create sanctuaries for whales and dolphins. There is another way. Here it is. Well, I, I have to say that um, that film, Whales Without Walls, was uh, produced uh, by Matt Stam um, and uh, a number of members of our team, and it featured our executive director, Charles Vinnick, uh, who was the project manager for the uh, Free Willy Keiko uh, project. Oh, well, I uh, love that movie so much. Yes, well, he was the project manager for the real whale who, who was able to be rehabilitated and, and uh, spend a lot of time in the wild, uh, returned to the wild in Iceland. So just wanted to give him a shout out. <laughs> so um, now I'd like to, uh, if there aren't any questions about this, get into my presentation and then we can chat and talk and discuss things. Uh, my presentation won't be that long, but it will be um, sort of the whole reason why we're actually doing what you saw in the video. So let's get started. Thank you, Lori. Okay, great. 
So let's get started with the first slide. Thank you. So I always start out with a little bit of information or background on where dolphins and whales come from, who they are. Not only is it a fascinating story, but it kind of gives you insight into who they are. Um, dolphins and whales, as many of you know, are cetaceans. Cetaceans are uh, a mammal, mammalian order. And there are currently two suborders within that order, the odontocetes. And here's an example, um, the uh, bottlenose dolphin and the mysticetes. These are the baleen whales. Now, what's interesting is that when they first uh, started evolving, um, there was a very early version of dolphins and whales that became extinct, and those were called archaeocetes for ancient whale. Now, a lot of people are interested in who the closest modern living relative is to whales and dolphins, and it's this guy on the right, the hippopotamus. Um, the hippopotamus is actually an ungulate, um, and they are the closest genetically, phylogenetically, evolutionarily to dolphins and whales. So they might not look like dolphins and whales, but there's a lot about them that resembles them. So in our next slide, I'm, talk, I'm showing that there are a great, there's a great variety of dolphin and whales. I mean, we hear about maybe a handful of dolphin and whale species humpback whales, sperm whales, orcas, bottlenose dolphins, but there's actually 76 different species of toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and 14 different species of mysticetes or baleen whales. We're going to be talking about mainly uh, the beluga whales and uh, who are monodontidae, and orcas and bottlenose dolphins and other delphinids. Um, and that's the largest family of, of dolphin um, that, that we have. So let's take a look at how we got um, to this point. It's a fascinating story. It's probably the best story of evolution ever. Um, now on the bottom left, you see uh, an animal that is clearly a land animal with a tail and whiskers. This is the first whale. And this whale lived about 50 million years ago. And his name was Pakasidis because he was found in an area that is now Pakistan. And this whale uh, went back into the water for unknown reasons and became fully aquatic over 10 or 15 million years. So they went through a number of transitions, like this whale, which is called the walking whale, uh, Ambulocetus. He swam and walked on land. And there were a number of early transitional forms where they lost their hind limbs and became more dolphin-like over the millions of years until they were fully aquatic. And there, the early forms of the modern species began to appear, like this guy with very small hind limbs and the blowhole, which is really the nostril, went up the, to the top of the head uh, to enable them to swim and breathe at the same time. And about 35 to 30 to 35 million years ago, the ancestors of the early modern forms really had a big shift in their brains. In other words, their brains just got a lot larger. And I'll show you that in a minute. And now on uh, modern day, we have um, all of the dolphins and whales that we know. So let's take a look at what the brains of these animals were doing uh, while they were evolving and adapting to a fully aquatic life. Well. This is a, a, on the left, a drawing of uh, an archaeocy brain um, from 37 million years ago. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but there are certain things I want you to know about what happened to the brains of ancestral dolphins and whales as they evolved. 
one of the things that happened is the brains became more elaborated. And if you look at the part of the brain called the cerebrum, which is the bulbous part of the brain, um, you can see going from 37 million years to 27 million years to 14 million years to the modern form, that the brain just expanded out and the cerebrum became quite large, both in absolute size and relative to their body. And that's very much like what happened in human evolution, where our cerebrum just evolved and elaborated. And so they started out not very brainy, and they became one of the most brainy mammals on the planet today. So let's take a look at those brains. What you see on the left is me holding a dolphin brain. And that brain comes from a dolphin who died uh, now from natural causes. And what I want you to see in that in that slide is the fact that this brain of a bottlenose dolphin is so large compared with our brains. So that brain could never fit into my head. And you might say, well, you know, but dolphins are bigger than us anyway, so everything's bigger. That's true, but there's also a caveat to that. On the right, you see a cutaway drawing of a bottlenose dolphin showing how the brain would be oriented in their body, in their skull. We're used to seeing dolphins, beluga whales, others with this high forehead, but that's not really where the brain is. The brain sits behind that in the skull, just like us, and uh, is oriented in a slightly different way than ours. It has a different organization to it. But that's what it would look like if you were to see it in the body. So let's take a further look at these brains. Now, these are three pretty impressive brains. Um, the one on the left is a beluga whale brain. The one in the middle is an orca or killer whale brain. And the one on the right is a human brain. These are not to scale. So. Um, the orca and beluga brain would be much, much larger than the human brain. But all of these brains have a few things in common that make them pretty impressive. Um, first of all, they're all large, right? And you see the orca brain is 5,000 grams compared to 1,300 grams for the human brain. But these brains, as I mentioned before, not only became really large in absolute size, but they became large relative to their body. And that's important because if you are a species that has a really large brain for your body size, that means that doing a lot of thinking and problem solving and analysis and all of that is really important to you. Brains are really expensive metabolically. And so you only have a big brain if thinking and cognition and intelligence are a big part of who you are as a species. And so that's the case with dolphins and whales, as well as primates, as well as our own species. When you look at the beluga whale, the top is the front and the bottom is the back. Those brains, as large as they are, are still 2.2 times larger than you'd expect for a beluga body size. And that brain, actually has more wrinkles on the surface than the human brain. And I'll get to that in a minute. In the middle, you see an orca brain. And that brain is two and a half times larger than expected for an orca's body size. Our brains are seven times larger than expected for a primate of our brain size. Now, if you look in the middle, you can see the orca brain. And if you look on the surface, you'll see that it is, has a lot of wrinkles on the surface. Those are called gyri and sulci, or you can say that it is the most gyrified brain on the planet because it is. Even though wrinkles on the surface of the brain do indicate the fact that 
we as uh, primate species have packed a lot of neocortex or thinking part of the brain into our skull. It turns out that the belugas and orcas and many other dolphins and whales have us beat when it comes to that measure of brain elaboration. With the orca brain being the most gyrified and neocorticalized brain on the planet, meaning they have more neocortex, more thinking part of the brain in proportion to their brain size than we do. So let's go on to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look at some other dolphin and whale species. As I mentioned, uh, human brains are about seven times the size you'd expect for our body size. There are a number of dolphin species swimming around in the oceans today that have brains three, four, five times larger than expected. And uh, some of those species are the white-sided dolphin that you see in the upper left, the common dolphin to the right of it, the rough-toothed dolphin uh, just below the, white, the uh, common dolphin, and the bottlenose dolphin on the lower left. And all of these dolphins and whales have brain sizes that are so large that they're second only to humans in the whole animal kingdom. So dolphins and whales are extremely brainy animals. So let's like a look at what those brains are doing. Those brains were evolved to thrive in a particular environment. And that environment is in the ocean, traveling with their family. Their lives in, in the wild involve lots of traveling over hundreds of miles, ranging uh, over thousands of miles, diving deep, living in family groups and complex social networks that are closely bonded you mentioned uh, Brooke the Talikwa and her infant who didn't survive and her grief over letting go of her dead infant. That is not uh, rare for dolphins and whales. They're very emotionally bonded to each other. And they have different social roles. Um, those big brains are also the basis for these animals being very cultural. They have cultural traditions, just like you and I, um, where they learn how to be a member of their social group uh, from their elders. And of course, in the ocean where you're traveling with your family and your friends, you're exploring, it's stimulating. And that big brain needs that kind of stimulation in order to be healthy. Um, that's the environment that those big brains evolved in, and that's the environment that those big brains need to be in to develop normally. Now, with that said, let's take a look at what the contrast is with life in marine parks. It's not, it's pretty stark. Um, in marine parks where animals are kept in tanks, it is pretty much the opposite of how they are meant to live. There's either overcrowding or isolation. There's artificial grouping, separations. Uh, what you saw in Whales Without Walls is uh, a mother and her daughter separated. Uh, the daughter was taken out of the tank and put in another facility and the mother cried out. Uh, for her daughter until she finally realized that she would never see her again. Um, these are the kinds of things that happen in marine parks. They are forced to perform and they are forced to have contact with humans. Um, and they live in really barren environments with no choices about how to spend their day and very little stimulation. So I want you to think about that huge convoluted brain that's even bigger than you would expect and put that brain in a tank where there's really no place to go, nothing to do, and all you do is perform 
uh, for food. Um, and you can't have a culture, you can't have a social network or any of the things that that brain evolved to do. So the consequences of that are, in the next slide I'll show you, the consequences are really dire for them. And this is true of all large brained animals. Highly intelligent animals who depend upon learning and social learning and, and other forms of learning don't do well in zoos and aquariums because they need so much more than they can actually be given. What happens to dolphins and whales in aquariums? Well, we know now that they suffer from a lot of opportunistic infections. They're under chronic stress. And just like you and I, if we're stressed, we might get a cold. Our immune system goes down and we get a cold. Same thing for them, only they're so stressed that this leaves them open to all kinds of more serious infections. And they not uncommonly die of pneumonia, encephalitis, gastric ulcers, those kinds of stress-related diseases that you see even in humans and other, and other uh, animals who are forced to live in captivity. They also show repetitive abnormal behaviors incessant circling, grating their teeth on the gates, banging their heads against the tank walls. On the left, you see a picture of the teeth of a whale named Kiska. She's an orca who has been living alone for many years in marine land, Canada. And you can see she really doesn't even have any teeth. And that's because she's grind, she grinds her teeth against the hard surfaces of the tank. And over years, She's ground them down to nothing. And those teeth have to be drilled out and they can cause all kinds of systemic infections. Um, so most orcas who live in concrete tanks have teeth that are damaged. And it's because of this incessant grating. Um, there's also hyperaggression. Uh, the inability to know how to parent uh, their children and depressive behaviors like logging on the surface, you know, just logging on the surface, immobile, not really doing anything. And, the, and all of this, all of this going on just shortens their lifespans. And captive orcas and captive belugas and most captive dolphins and whales, for instance, have much shorter, significantly shorter lifespans in the tanks than they do in the wild. So here's the question. What can we do about these highly intelligent mammals living in tanks? This is a problem because there's over 3,000 of them who are living in tanks globally. We don't have an exact number. We know there's something like 22 orcas and uh, many, many other uh, dolphins and whales right here in North America. And so the answer is the Whale Sanctuary Project. And not just our project, but sanctuary uh, in and of itself. The alternative to keeping these animals in tanks and uh, marine parks is not to take them all and dump them back in the ocean because they couldn't survive. What it is, is an alternative that has successfully been done for elephants, primates, bears, all other large mammals. And this is a concept drawing of what we are going to create. This is concept drawing that shows that we will have a huge space over 300 times the size of the largest performance tank in the world. It will be a place where dolphins and whales can thrive for the first time in their life, where they'll be in a natural environment. We'll still care for them, we'll still feed them, but they won't be forced to perform they won't be breeding, so we won't make more captive animals. And we're going to promote their autonomy and natural life. And in the meantime, from the, we are also going to be 
using sanctuary as an example of how you really educate kids, the generations coming up and even older folks about why these animals need to be conserved in the wild and not kept in artificial environments. So we spent two and a half years looking for a perfect site for this sanctuary. And the sanctuary will be for maybe six to eight beluga whales, a couple of orcas, a really nice expansive bay. We finally found one and we found that bay in Nova Scotia. We spent a lot of time going up and down the coast of Nova Scotia, meeting with communities and looking at different sites. And we finally found one um, that's in the, on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. And this just gives your audience an idea of where Nova Scotia is compared with uh, the East Coast. And here it is. This is Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. And this is where the first permanent whale sanctuary in North America will be. And, and with that, I will turn it back to I, you guys to discuss. Thank you so much, Lori. That was, my emotions were all over the place. <laughs> Sad and excited and cheering and that was really great. Brooke, how about you? Same here, that was, I am so, so moved. I've just never seen, like I, I, I know that orcas aren't doing well, but I haven't seen like them banging their heads against the walls grinding their teeth. I haven't seen that. And I actually feel bad because we went once in Cabo to Dolphin Discovery. We didn't know then though, because uh, it's just, it was a good experience, but the dolphins did, I noticed, seem kind of depressed. They weren't frolicking like when you see them in the wild. And now I've actually learned to pref I prefer now going kayaking and then seeing spinner dolphins like jumping in the air doing flips and we did see that and that's preferable to, than to being kissed on the cheek by a dolphin so i just think they're more majestic and beautiful in the wild and your presentation really helped to show me that that is it was so beautiful well i couldn't have said it better <laughs> I really couldn't. Yes, and that's true for all dolphins and whales. I mean, orcas, beluga whales, pilot whales, um, you know, they just, they just aren't adapted to living in a tank. And it's not because um, of lack of effort. They have great veterinary care. They're fed. They're, you know, taken care of. But it just doesn't fit. And I always put it this way. It's like trying to get a square peg through a round hole. Mm -hmm. You could have all the good intentions in the world. It's just not going to work. And it's that's the case with dolphins and whales and tanks. Uh, the way I think of it is who would want to be locked in the most comfortable mansion in the world, right? With all your food. And whenever you get sick, doctors come in, the best doctors in the world, right? But you can't leave the house. You have to stay in the house. And you can't even open windows, right? And let's say you're famous, and then a bunch of people come in to interview you every day, right? Eventually, you'll just get bored out of your mind, right? And also probably be annoying, too. And if I was in a concrete tank, I, I don't think I could think of anything better to do than banging my head against a wall. So I think that's probably... I, I can't really say the orcas are crazy being in a tank because, I mean like bang their heads against the wall. There's nothing better to do. So what are they supposed to do? Doing flips? What are they supposed to do, right? It's it's a coping, it's, you know, it's, it's what you see in many animals and frankly, what you see in people who are emotionally disturbed. Um, you see the same kinds of repetitive self-harming behaviors. It's, it's something all mammals have and in response to stress. Um, I have another story to share. I remember 
when I was, I think in second grade, I took a survey. I asked 15 people, students, um, if they thought it was okay to have orcas and tanks. And everybody, everybody said, no, no, that's not okay. No way, right? And so I went home and I was so happy. And I was like, see, everyone, everyone understands. And my mom was like, but did you ask if they would go to SeaWorld? And I'm like, that's a good follow-up question. So I went to, to school the next day and asked that question. And everybody, except for one person, said, I would love to go to SeaWorld. I want to go there so badly, right? And but there's one person, but, but not because they said, oh, SeaWorld's bad. They just thought, eh, SeaWorld's boring. So that's why they didn't want to go. But that's that's not the reason we were looking for. And even my best friend said, I would love to go to SeaWorld. I really want to go to SeaWorld. I really, really, really want to go to SeaWorld. And so, so I went home and told my mom that. And she said, she said, yes. You see, people don't really think about it, right? People don't think it's okay to have animals in cages, but then they would go to a place that keeps animals in, in cages. They don't realize that they're supporting that, they're supporting the cages when they go to a place that has them. And so, yeah, this just kind of made me kind of confused, right? Don't people think about it? Right? Honestly, if I didn't know any better, I would have said, I want to go to SeaWorld. Right. Well, well, you know, that's such a good story because it shows several things. It shows that people really love these animals and they're so attracted to them and they're so interested in them. And the message they get from entertainment parks like SeaWorld is come and you'll learn about these animals. You'll learn, you know, who they are and they're happy and they're healthy and it's all okay. And so it, you know, alleviates a lot of misgivings that the people have when they come to see the animals performing. They think it's fun for the animals. And nothing could be further from the truth. And, and so what's important is to understand that people do want to protect these animals, learn about them, care about them, but there are other ways to do it. One of the ways is in a sanctuary, and, and in sanctuaries, you can see the animals from a distance, like you mentioned whale watching in the San Juan Islands from land. Um, we're going to actually have live feeds that come in so that you can be anywhere in the world. You can even be at SeaWorld and watch what the whales in the sanctuary are doing under the water at any given time. And that's so much more exciting than seeing them perform tricks so that they can get fed. They'll actually be able to do things that they want to do. And so you'll learn not about how they perform, but what they actually do when they're in their natural environment. Lori, what are some of the biggest challenges to seeing this beautiful idea to completion? Well, one of the biggest challenges uh, was first finding a site that was that fit all the physical criteria so that um, whales, the blue whales and orcas could live there and uh, be, be healthy. So things like temperature and salinity and, and we had to find a site that had deep enough water that they could dive on a large enough expanse so that it was really, you know, orders of magnitude greater than the largest tank, um, protected from really bad storms and, and so forth. And the other thing was finding a community that really embraced uh, what we were trying to do. We found that at Port Hilford in the community of Sherbrooke, um, up on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. Um, these wonderful people have just adopted this sanctuary project, they can't wait for the first whales to be in there so that they can look over them and care for them and, you know, be the bearers of the first North American sanctuary. Um, the, and this is a great point of pride for, for them. And, and so we've been so fortunate to find the right uh, physical environment and 
a community that embraces this project. Um, we couldn't have, we can't do it without them. And so that's been really, really important. What is the process for getting whales well, chosen to, if I'm a whale, how do I apply to be in the <laughs> sanctuary? <laughs> well, unfortunately there aren't any applications, but right now we're in the process of getting proper permits from the, the province and from Canada in order to have build a sanctuary site there, which would be a netted off area with different compartments. Um, there would be quarantine tanks. There would be a full service veterinary facility. Everything needed to take care of the animals, but it will be, you know, much, much larger and it will be in the actual ocean, in the cove, uh, in ocean water. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, what it means is that we are reaching out to facilities like SeaWorld, other places like Marineland in Canada, uh, to ask them if they would like to collaborate with us, to send some of their whales to the sanctuary and work with us to create this, this alternative. Um, and so we are not looking to close these places down. We're looking to say, okay, let's do something really new and different that's better for the animal's health, and we want to do it with you. So we're in the process of talking with different facilities, of letting them know that we want to come to the table and work with them, not against them. And of course, uh, you know, in terms of individual whales, you know, they will all have to be vetted for their health, their age, their, their psychology. So all kinds of things will have to be known about them before they become candidates for coming into the sanctuary. So Lori, have you learned anything about whales this year that you never knew before? So for me, that list is a mile long, including that they are related to hippos, which is amazing. But as an expert, have you learned anything new this year? Oh my gosh, I learn something new all the time. Um, and, you know, having studied these animals for over 30 years, um, you learn something new all the time and, and I, you realize you know very little about them. No one knows a lot about them because there's so much to know and they're so complex. Um, but I think I learned uh, the most this year and maybe the past couple of years uh, about the kinds of environments that they really, what, what a natural environment for them really, really looks like and what really, really um, can help them thrive. And, and the, the way I've done that is by going with uh, Charles Vinnick, our executive director and our team, up and down to the coast of Nova Scotia, the Pacific Northwest, and actually seeing possible sites and getting a real sense of what this could look like and picturing whales there. And that picture is what drives us to continue and to, to make this a reality. Absolutely. So we have a, a, a you know, young person here who obviously cares so much. Why should kids and teens care about whales and other sea creatures as much as Brooke does? And not just speaking to caring for these beautiful creatures because they deserve it, because we know that they do, but just also speaking to the interconnectivity of the climate and ecosystems, why is it so important that we care about protecting these creatures? Well, it's important for many reasons, but whales and dolphins, uh, who are living in tanks, for instance, are still wild animals, and they're the same whales and dolphins who are living in the natural environment. So they're all the, they're all in this we're all in this together. The whales and dolphins who are living free, free ranging, as they call it, are living in on the same planet as us. And whatever happens to the planet happens to them, as well as happens to us and and all the other animals. So. We are all living in the same environment. And the, the, the better we can protect our environment, the better we can not only just protect ourselves, but dolphins and whales and other animals. Once dolphins and whales start to 
become endangered or go extinct, that is a sign that something is not going right and um, that we need to do something because most of the problems that dolphins and whales have now are due to our activities. So it's really important to take responsibility for that and give back, do whatever you can to give back and make up for some of the things that our species has done to them. Absolutely. Brooke, what are you inspired to do next? Any ideas? Um, yes, I do have some ideas. I think the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to try really hard not to, you know, actually, I was tempted to go to SeaWorld because after you see all those videos, like those whales, like, and now with this and this and this, um, I am not tempted anymore. So I'm going to tell my friends not to do it. Just like we have already done. We have never gone to SeaWorld. And so that's, I think that's going to be a good next step. And I think, I think it's great to hear that, but I think also let's keep in mind that SeaWorld does do a lot of good things. They rescue a lot of animals. They have a lot of other aspects of their parks that are fine, you know, and it's really just the keeping of these animals in, in these tanks that's not a good thing. Um, so we, the message we have to send SeaWorld is you can change, you can change, you can do better. Um, we don't hate you. We just want you to do better by these right. animals. And, and that's a really good message. It's a little bit more nuanced than just don't buy a ticket, but it is a good message to send. That's right. We can reimagine what SeaWorld could look exactly. like, just, just like we could reimagine what these whales' lives could exactly. look like. Exactly, exactly. There's no shortage of imagination anywhere. Um, Thank you I, so much, Tori and Brooke. Yeah. Brooke, did you want to add something? Thank you so much. Oh, yes, and, and I will tell my friends to support Whale Sanctuary. Great. Because um, I just think that like, your cause is a really important one. And I, I actually, not just because it's good for the whales, but also because I really, I just really have feelings for marine mammals. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, well, that, this is something that has been a dream of many people for a long time in the marine mammal community. And we know that this is the right thing to do and we couldn't do it without feeling the support of students like you, people literally all over the world. Thank you. Brooke, you can tell your friends to go to whalesanctuaryproject.org. And if they're old enough for social media, they can follow Whale Sanctuary on Instagram and Facebook at Whale Sanctuary Project and on Twitter at whale underscore sanctuary. So once again, thank you to Dr. Lori Marino and to our young friend Brooke. Um, we just are so thankful for this opportunity and we can't wait to see over the next, you know, several many years, the progress, um, the progress for our, our lovely friends that will be in the sanctuary. Well, stay tuned and thank you for giving us the opportunity to tell people about what Very we're good. doing and uh, follow what we're doing and we'll always be posting upgrades to to what we're doing so thank you so much and thanks for for just your fellow feeling for for other animals and Lori, you have some uh friends coming up the next two days on the environmental scouts uh change maker series we have heirs to our oceans yes day and wednesday and so we know that that's a, an organization that you know well, yes. and um, we hope that you'll tune in and watch our young speakers discuss various issues. That's um, great. The next couple of days. They're a wonderful group of really dedicated young people, um, and I highly recommend uh, getting to know that group. Um, so that's exciting. So great. So tomorrow and Wednesday at 10 a.m. 
All right, change makers. Thank you to to everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Brooke. Bye. Bye.